every school day for 10 days, I'm giving you something you can do to kickstart your students' sense of numbers and increase their fluency with mathematics. Welcome to Build Math Minds, the podcast, where fidelity to your students is greater than fidelity to your textbook. I'm your host, Christina Tonnevold, the recovering traditionalist and buildmathminds.com founder, where my mission is to change the way we teach elementary math to our kiddos. So are you ready to start building math minds and not just creating calculators? Let's get started. Over the two weeks of this kickstart, I'm giving you an action step each day that you can take towards building your students' number sense and increasing their fluency with mathematics. We can't magically build your students' number sense and fluency by the end of our two weeks, but we will have kickstarted it, and you'll have a roadmap to keep building it throughout this school year. So make sure you are signed up so that you get all of the kickstart resources at buildmathminds.com slash 10 day dash kickstart. At the beginning of this kickstart, we looked at theoretical ideas that help build your students' mathematical understandings in days one through six. Then we looked at incorporating number routines and contextual word problems as ways to put those ideas into practice. With today's tip, you might hit some of those theoretical ideas, but today is really more about once you've done those things, you need to help solidify it with your students by practicing. Day's nine, day nine's tip is use a new way to have your students practice math tomorrow. Before you click off and think, wow, that sounds easy, I wanna get up on my soapbox and preach a bit about how I think we are doing math practice all wrong and what we should be doing instead. There is a common phrase that practice makes perfect, meaning that you need to practice more so that you can become perfect at something. However, the more life experience I've had, the more I realize that is not entirely accurate. For example, I love to golf. I'm not the best at it, but I can hit the ball well when I hit the ball well. <laughs> Problem is that I don't hit the ball well that often. So if the theory of practice makes perfect were true, then I should be able to go out to the golf course and practice and eventually my swing will get perfect, right? Yeah, we know it doesn't go that way. When I do get out there to practice, all I'm doing is practicing my bad swing. Practice only works if you already know what you're doing, if you are already doing it right. To get better at golf, I need instruction that helps my swing get better. Without the instruction, my swing does not improve just with practice. I'm just getting better at my bad swing. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. When I go out and play nine holes of golf, I tend to hit the ball around 40 to 50 swings. That's not counting my putts. I know you can judge me. I'm, <laughs> I, I like it, but I'm not that good. Instead of getting better, I am creating muscle memory of that bad swing that just gets ingrained deeper and deeper into me every time I go out. The same is true in helping kids learn mathematics. They need practice, but that practice doesn't actually instruct them. It just helps make their thinking much more permanent. So think about this. What if you had a student who is working on a worksheet and every time they see the problem seven times six, they write 46. For some reason, they have it in their head that seven times six is 46. Then the next day, they continue to write 46 every time they see seven times six. And maybe even the next day, because let's be honest, we aren't always the quickest with grading work and getting it back to them. <laughs> so by the time they get back their paper that has the problems marked wrong, they've probably practiced seven times six equals 46, like five to 10 times. Plus, just seeing it marked wrong on a paper does nothing to help them learn what the actual answer is. I am all for practice. I think kids need more practice, but it has to happen at the right times to work on something that they already know because practice is a way to help them make it more permanent. Learning, again, does not happen from repeated practice. The learning happens through other experiences. 
like the number routines and the contextual word problems. Practice should be happening after the learning has taken place. We tend to think practice is what helps kids become fluent in math. But to be truly fluent in math, Susan Jo Russell's article about computational fluency says that we need to ensure students have these three things. Accuracy, which just means they get correct answers, right? Efficiency, they should be quick with getting those answers. And they need flexibility, which is alternate ways to think through problems. Math practice is usually building efficiency because you are working on getting them to recall the information quicker and hopefully some accuracy as well, as long as they have the right answers as they practice. But you aren't really building their flexibility. Flexibility is built as you help students work on developing their number sense. Yep, those eight number sense concepts we talked about previously. If you wanna build true fluency, that means building accuracy, efficiency, and flexibility. You can't jump right into practicing with your students because they need that solid foundation of understanding and building their number sense first. So that when you do give them the practice, they have that flexibility to draw upon to help them actually become more accurate and more efficient. So when kids are finally ready for practice, what should practice look like? I don't believe practice should be repeatedly using worksheets. I'm not opposed to worksheets for practice. I just think they should be used sparingly and in a way that I'll talk about at the end of this training. I want you to have some ways for your students to practice that they will actually enjoy. My number one recommendation for enjoyable practice is games. Any kind of mathematical game is powerful. Games make it fun. If you've ever played games in your classroom, you've seen that when it's time to stop, they'll moan and say they don't wanna stop. Plus, half the time they don't even realize they were doing math. Games also provide tons of practice in a short time frame. In like the 10 minutes they are playing, they might do 50 or more problems. Now I know what you're thinking at this point because I've heard it so much, but how do we assess their work when they are playing a game? So there's a few ways to kind of approach this. First, you can have them write down the problem as, as they solve them. However, that tends to get boring and cumbersome and starts to make take the fun out of playing. Your next option is to let the kids play and then have a couple minutes at the end for the students to answer this question or maybe even give it to them ahead of time. But the question is, in your game today, what problem did you encounter that was the hardest to solve and which one was the easiest? You don't even need to have them explain why. Just have them write which problems, and that gives you insight into their thinking as they practice that day. Another option is that when they are playing the games, don't assess them. Just use it as an opportunity to observe. Walk around and have discussions with kids and use that time to make notes on your observation sheet we talked about back in day three of this kickstart. Now, as much as I love games, Another problem everyone has with games is the time it takes to make the games and teach the kids the rules of the games. So a few years back, I created what I called Evergreen Games. They are five games that once you teach kids how to play, you can switch out the content and you don't have to teach the rules of the game because they already know them. I didn't create the games, I just compiled them. They are games that have been around for a while. For example, one of the games is Memory, you know, the matching game. Once you teach kids how to play memory, you can switch out the game pieces to be different kinds of matches. I have a free download of the five games and in the download, you get 19 games that are pre-made for you. Some use whole numbers, some are focused on building number sense, some are fractions, and some are focused on practicing multiplication. You get to see lots of different ways to use the games. When you get the link for the Evergreen Games, it will have you make a copy of the file so that you could use those templates and modify the games to be whatever content you want. Now, inside the Flexibility Formula courses, I took those templates and created games for all the eight number sense concepts. Participants in the course get editable Google Slides that have over 100 pre-made games for you to use, and that's both in the pre-K or the K2 course and a different set with over 100 games for the third through fifth grade course. If you are taking part in the Kickstart, we do have a special for you to receive a gift from us when you enroll in the Flexibility Formula course by a specific date. 
The details are in your Kickstart checklist, so go check that out if you are thinking about taking the course. Okay, my second recommendation for doing practice with your students is to do worksheets, but give them choice in what they do on those worksheets. Not every student in your classroom needs to do the same set of problems, and they don't even need to do all the problems. Giving students choice in the problems they do is a great way to differentiate and is another time you can gain valuable information about your students' thinking and understanding of math. In one of my virtual math summits, Zandra D. Aranjo did a session about the power of choice. One of the things she talked about was letting students pick which problems on the worksheet or in a set of problems for the day that they wanted to solve. You might have them pick a specific number of problems. For example, just say they pick any eight that they want and explain why they pick those. You could have them choose two of the most difficult problems and two of the easiest. And again, explain why you pick them. You could have them choose five problems to solve. And then once they get the answers, they have to make five new problems that end up with the same answers. Those are just a few ways to let students have choice in their practice problems when you have a set of problems you want all the students to work from. Another way to differentiate while giving students time to practice is to use parallel or tiered tasks. Again, this comes from Xander's session and over on the Kickstart resource page, I'll link up some examples of all these ways to let kids have choice when practicing. Parallel tasks are similar sets of problems, just with different levels of problems or quantities that all get to the same learning goal. And the key here is that kids choose which they set they want to complete, not you. Students are given one sheet of paper with all three sets of tasks, and they decide which one they want to work on that, on that day. If a student chooses a set that's too difficult, we'll chat with them about choosing a different set. If a student chooses one you don't think is hard enough for them, guess what? They're still working on the learning goal. They just aren't pushing themselves. So you'd want to chat with them about pushing themselves if you're concerned with that. You need kids to practice because it does help them retain information for later as it solidifies the information they are learning. But make sure they have the understanding and flexibility built first so that they aren't making incorrect information more permanent. And be sure to use ways that are fun, engaging, and meet the students where they are. So again, the day nine tip is use a new way to have your students practice math tomorrow. Don't forget to head over to the Kickstart resource page that was emailed out to you when you registered for the Kickstart so that you can get those evergreen games and the examples of choice in math practice to help you do today's tip in your classroom tomorrow. If you haven't signed up for the Kickstart, go to buildmathminds.com slash 10 day dash kickstart. I'll email you the checklist and the link to the resources page. Today is day nine's tip and there are nine other days of tips to help you start the year off with a solid mathematical foundation for your students. That's all for day nine and I'll see you back here tomorrow for our final day of this 10 day number sense kickstart.